Welcome to the Kentucky History Channel, where we strive to bring you all the Kentucky history content you want and you deserve. Kentucky is a part of all of us, and we plan on covering all the history we can, from Pike County to Fulton County, from Louisville to Harlan. Here on our YouTube channel, you can find many videos dedicated to different events, people, governors, and places in Kentucky. There's something for everybody. While you're here, if you like the channel, hit the subscribe button and the notification button so you get notified anytime new Kentucky history is available. And if you want to support the channel, we have a Patreon page as well, or patreon.com slash kyhistorypod. You've probably heard about Daniel Boone, but what about the rest of the frontiersmen who came to Kentucky and settled? That's what we want to bring to the Kentucky History Channel, the stories of the untold, the stories of those forgotten. One thing to expect on our channel is great Kentucky content. Some stories that you've never heard of. The Knight Riders, who began in Western Kentucky. Bloody Monday, the riots in Louisville. The assassination of Governor Goebel, the only governor ever assassinated in the United States. Stories from all over Kentucky, stories that are unforgettable once you've heard them. You can find out who counties in Kentucky are named after and how your county got started. From beginning to end, we plan to document every county in Kentucky, all 120. Reach out to us on all of our social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And also leave a comment on one of our YouTube videos. You can also check out our podcast episodes. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and many more. Welcome back to the Kentucky History Podcast. I'm your host, Jameson Cable, and I'm here with David Kirkpatrick. He joined us recently uh, talking about the, his book and just the War of 1812 and how uh, Kentucky was a big part of that. Uh, we got to a certain point. We had to make them stop so we can move on and focus 100% on the River Raven, or River Raven, River Raisin Massacre, massacre the Battle of Frenchtown. What is, what is the official go-to on the title of this? Yeah, and for that question, I think you have to ask uh, where you are. So <laughs> if you're in Canada or if you're east of the mountains, I think the Battle of Frenchtown probably wins out as the name. Uh, Frenchtown was the little town where the battle took place, obviously. It's modern-day Monroe, Michigan. But if you're a Kentuckian uh, or, or interested in Kentucky history, it's often referred to as the River Raisin Massacre because not only do we fight two battles there, but there are some unfortunate events that happen immediately after that second battle that give the battle or give it that name. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I, you know, I don't know if uh, the listeners may not know. They should. I've had a video about the, uh, the Battle of River Raisin or uh, Remember the Raisin. Um, you know, that was the battle cry. We'll, we can get to that in a little bit. But on the um, oh, YouTube channel, just, you know, a quick about five minute video, six minutes, uh, just a summary. Uh, we're going to get into a little bit more detail uh, tonight and, uh, and uh, really, uh, I guess, dive into it. But before we get too much, set us up a little bit more. I guess a summary of where we're at before, how we got to this point as far as in Frenchtown or Monroe, Michigan uh, sure. at this point. Well, all the enthusiasm, all the excitement that the Kentucky militia had demonstrated at the start of the war has kind of faded at this point. They have marched northward way back in August with the intention of moving in, defeating the British and their Indian allies and coming home. So at this point, it's early January and uh, they're still not at home. Uh, Governor Isaac Shelby had requested uh, people at home, the women at home, to sew coats and jackets and socks and blankets to send northward. We talked about that last time. And that has eased uh, the situation some. But these guys are starving. They're cold. And they're kind of stuck for a few months. Because what William Henry Harrison, the general, former uh, governor of the Indiana Territory, and general of the Army, has done is to divide his army into three separate wings that could be uh, more easily fed and supplied because they're spread out. 
And the left wing is made up almost entirely of Kentucky troops under the command of General James Winchester, who was from Tennessee. And they have been on the Maumee River uh, in camp, and uh, they are just starving to death. They're trying to make shoes out of, uh, you know, plants and vegetation and that kind of thing. And uh, they're really chomping at the bit for action. And what they're supposed to do is wait until everything freezes over completely solid. And at that point, uh, Harrison's going to be able to move his artillery. He's going to be able to move uh, heavy wagons. Everyone's going to be able to march northward over the frozen ground. They can recapture Detroit and go on into uh, what we refer to as Ontario today. It wasn't called that back then, but in, and strike forward for the heart of Canada. And that probably would have worked had it not been for the events that took place with the raisin. Mm-hmm. Now, I do want to throw up a quick picture of a uh, general James Winchester, the Tennessee and, um, Last time we talked, you, you mentioned the um, toilet incident or the outhouse incident. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they, they were not too friendly or they did not. Uh, they were not too supportive. I guess that would be a good way to say it. That's right. They had <laughs> signed up to fight under Harrison. And the idea that at the last moment, the Kentuckians felt like it was sort of a bait and switch. And of course, to everyone else, it's obvious. Harrison's commander of the entire army. Mm-hmm. You have to break into groups. This guy is your immediate officer. But they were having none of that, and poor General <laughs> Winchester suffered the brunt. <laughs> uh, that's true. That's, 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 it's it's pretty pretty comical to think of the Tennessee Kentucky rivalry starting that's right. so so far back. Um, what uh, what was the date? So we're we're looking at I mean War of 1812, but I think uh-huh. this happened in more of 1813. Yes, they, they again they start that march northward in August of 1812, but by this point we're uh, on the eve of the battle. We're January of 1813, and uh, so yeah, they've been gone for several months and still dressed in their summer clothes, except for what's been sent northward on boat. Yeah, and that's never that's never a good uh, good thing for an army is to be you know marching in winter. Um, right. I think uh, you know I think history tells us quite a bit about that. Um, Very much right, so. so so they're getting close here. They're getting up to um, French town. Um, and, and this is what, well, like you said, the step to take Detroit, you know, they, yeah. they want to get to this point so then they can move on to Detroit. Uh, Cause it's not too far of a distance. I wish I would have had a, prepared a map to show that kind of the distance, but don't have that. Um, so what's the first step? They're starving. They're hungry. What goes on? They are, and, and they're, of course, they're dispirited some. Uh, there's been a few court marshals along the way to try to instill discipline, but they're waiting. They're doing what they're told to do, and they are going to wait there until the ground freezes like Harrison instructs them, except one day there's a visitor in camp, a man of French descent, who was from Frenchtown, and uh, he reported that there was a large Native American population there, a number of warriors, and they had intended to burn Uh, the little community down on the orders of the British, and they were seeking American help. And so Winchester, probably relieved just to have something to do, convenes a council of war with his officers. They're debating what to do. And the next day, a second man shows up in camp with the same background and the exact same story. We need help, and we need American support now. So Winchester has a uh, decision to make. Are you going to send back and ask Harrison what to do? Or are you going to seize the initiative and move forward, disobeying the orders you've been given? And so that's what launches this campaign forward. Winchester decides to send uh, 550 to 650 men northward to secure the the, uh, town while he writes to Harrison. And uh, that kicks off the campaign. Mm -hmm. So now, so was this town, was there any resistance or they, they they were willing or they did need that help? All, all indications seem to suggest that the majority of the folks in the town were, were willing to cooperate with the Americans. Uh, I think, you know, the majority of them probably being a French descent, as the name suggests, they were sympathetic to the American cause to some degree. And so, uh, they, you know, they were happy to have them there. Um, or certainly, I'll put it this way, once the Americans are there and the British are gone, there's no resistance. Uh-huh. But French is really small at this time. And I forget the number of residents, but it's a few hundred. Yep. And it's on, again, the banks of uh, the Raisin River, and that borders it on the south. And then on two sides, uh, they have a palisade or they have, you know, a wooden wall. So one side is left open, uh, the river's on the other side, and then two of the sides are kind of boxed in. And uh, there was the artist's name, uh, 
Tim Kurtz. There was a man named Tim Kurtz who painted a picture of what he thought it would look like at the time. And uh, I, I'm no great judge of art, but it, it certainly fits the description of the time. It's a beautiful painting. So if, mm. if you Google that, you'll you'll see what he painted. And it really kind of gives you the mindset of what's what they're what's, walking what into. They're looking for. Yeah. Um, and, and so the initial battle, I mean, um, I guess, how, how long does that take? A matter of hours, they attack, I think, towards midday and maybe a little in the afternoon, and they fight until sunset. So this group of men marches forward. It's completely Kentucky militia, and uh, they kind of catch the British off guard. Um, the river raisin is not too deep at this point, and uh, so they rush the river, and they come up the bank on the other side, and they're clawing at the ground. And, uh, you know, they, they, there are accounts of the enemy saying, uh, well, they're approaching on all fours, you know, and because they were just eager to climb up and, and get going. And so a battle sort of takes place in town between the British and their native allies. And slowly a retreat happens and it gets into the woods uh, behind the town. And up to this point, you know, the American militia has been trying to march in line and fire, as is the method of the day. You know, you line yeah. up, you wait for your order. And then uh, as it gets into the woods, the phrase they always use is they say, well, the battle became more general. And what they mean is it just fell apart and you're hiding yeah. behind trees and you're firing whenever you think you have a chance. So the initial battle is a, a success for the Americans. It ends because dark falls. And as they straggle back into camp, eyewitness accounts, uh, sometimes say 12 other accounts. I think the National Park Service lists 13 American dead, about 50 wounded, a few more maybe. And so, uh, you know, the, the British Which, have said, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but that's that's out of hun hundreds, you know. Um, yeah. What, yeah. So that's not too bad when you think of you know, six, seven hundred, if more. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah out of the six hundred and fifty Kentuckians there, if you're thirteen dead and, and about fifty wounded, and you've taken the town, and so you've sent the British and and, and you know uh, there may have been some militia there, but these are you know British soldiers that you've put on the run, and you have taken the first step on the way back to Detroit, and so not only are they happy that they have the town when they begin checking the cellars and things, there are dried apples, there's food, there's sugar, yeah. there's, there's all these things. Yeah. So for men who've not had much to eat or clothing or ha haven't slept in a building for the better part of four months, this is a victory. Yeah. And uh, so they settle in and everyone is pretty excited about it, except for William Henry Harrison when he receives word um, in general, Winchester uh, writes to him and said, Hey, you know, we've won this battle. I just want you to know, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for further orders. And uh, Harrison, I won't say panics, but he has a better understanding of, of the strategic blunder that's been made here. Because yeah. these three groups have been camped safely in American territory, these three wings of the army. Yeah. Now you've got one wing that has shot forward and uh, into dangerous territory, contested territory, all by itself. And Winchester is bringing the rest of his army up so they're going to have more than a thousand men, but you know the British are just across the border. I mean, and Harrison uh, the, is not sure yeah. he can get through in time. Yeah, I was going to say like just I mean the river really. I mean they're not far at all. I mean, right. um, and, and so again the three the three wings. So you got Harrison, Winchester. Who was the third third wing? You know I don't recall off the top of my head. They were a little farther. Harrison's in the center. Of course, yeah. so he's closest, and I forget who's on the right wing. Um, but yeah, the, you know they're they're a few hundred miles apart, and uh, it just is not a good plan to isolate yourself like that in the woods yeah. when you don't know where the enemy is or how strong they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but like you said, and, and you know the you know strategic obviously was a bit of a blunder. Um, but you know the men, I guess, good for morale, good to have a victory, good to get all those right. things. Um, of course, it's easy in hindsight to say, you know, he kind of screwed up. But at the moment, that was probably he, he was stuck between my men are, uh, you know, uh, what, 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 what's the term again? Um, losing uh, or not, not going AWOL, but um, court martialed. You know, right. Court martialed, right. you know, the, the men are hungry. We got to do something. Um, yeah. And, you know, at, at the moment, you make a call. and uh, Right. And, you know, the people in the village, you're going to want their support for when you do march north. I mean, you need the population support. And if you don't move forward in Winchester's mind and the village gets burned to the ground, by the time you get there, they may not be eager to help you. So, again, as you said, he was working to do what he thought was the right thing and what probably seemed like the right thing at the time. 
But, you know, even after that, it falls apart for them. Um, the ground is frozen. And when some of the men come up, uh, they don't really, uh, you know, fortify the way they should. I mentioned the wooden wall on two sides of the town, but that's not nearly enough. Um, <laughs> you know, the, there was a, a, actually a section of federal troops or part of a regiment of federal troops with them. So it's not just Kentucky militia. He also has command of part of the U.S. Uh, 17th, 17th Infantry. United States Army. Now, this is also made up just of Kentuckians, but, uh, you know, it is a federal unit, so they've got federal uniforms, and they uh, don't actually camp inside the town. Per regulations, you're not supposed to do that, so, uh, you know, you're supposed to quarter troops and, and houses. So they camp in the open field beside Frenchtown. Uh, that, doesn't to be sound... <laughs> yeah, that, does, that doesn't sound good to be in the open field with no cover. That... <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but you know, in the minds of the Kentuckians, we've sent the British running back to Canada. They're done. Them, we'll yeah. again. <laughs> Not quite the way it played out. No, 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 uh, no. That's 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 roll one in um, army tactics is uh, don't don't uh, I, I wouldn't say oh, don't sleep with your back towards the enemy, but uh, you know don't sleep sleep in an open field. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But you know there was hundreds of them. Maybe they were thinking, you know, we got we just need to spread out. We got so many people here. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, we mentioned this uh, mentioned this um, a while back uh, last time about the journals of uh, some of the soldiers. Did you was there any good journals from the people in this battle or um, you know, in this campaign? I guess if you could say it that way. Absolutely. And I know it's on the spot, but no, that's okay. There, there's a guy named Elias Darnell, and his journal. I forget who publishes it, but someone publishes his journal with another man whose last name is Mallory. I want to say the first name might be Thomas, mm -hmm. but you can get it. It's a, it's a thin book, but he lives through the entire thing. He talks about leaving Kentucky. He talks about the oh, battle man. and being, he ends up being captured and he's got some pretty humorous conversations because he ends up being quartered. And I think it's him, maybe someone else in the book, but I'm pretty sure it's him. But one, one of the Kentucky militiamen ends up being quartered in a Canadian house uh, on their way back to be prisoners. And it turns out the man had lived in the United States prior to the American Revolution. He was an older man, and he had been a loyalist, and he had fled oh. to Canada to escape the U.S. government. So now this guy is kind of giving them down the road about uh, you got what you had coming to you. <laughs> and the Kentucky militiamen thought, well, we're captured anyway. So they're arguing right back. Yeah. So there's a funny argument between the two sides. And then after a while, they realize no one's going to win, so they – go back to just normal conversation, but it's, it's a neat <laughs> journal because yeah. it's, you know, some of them are adopted or they attempt to adopt them into Indian tribes. Some are kept POWs and they're paroled, um, you know, later in, in the year. And everybody who doesn't know parole back then uh, was a common practice. And basically the enemy doesn't have enough men to guard you. So what they're going to do is they're going to take your name and they're going to release you. If you promise, if you swear an oath, never to fight again. And the understanding is you're a man of honor. You're going to keep that oath. But if you don't and they capture you, they're immediately going to execute you. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these guys are captured uh, after the second battle and they march them to Niagara and then they're released and they make their way back to Kentucky. Yeah. And then they, they don't ever join up again or nothing. No, like no, that. Never <laughs> <been> that, <you laughs> know. Everybody keeps their word. <laughs> right. And then when they get captured again, they use a different name and say, yep, yep. You know. <laughs> no um, ideas, so, you know, that's right. That's right. Um, so, uh, well, man, that, that sounds so cool. I, I, I will definitely write that down and try to get uh, my hands on that journal. Cause, um, but well, it's, it's just so interesting. That's a pretty uh, cool account that, yeah. uh, they have that and especially since he survived because obviously this is a massacre we're talking about right not gonna be a lot of survivors um well i guess there is plenty enough survivors but you know uh uh so the british are pu pushed back um winchester and uh, winchester's upset with um whole no whole right uh, uh harrison's upset with harrison. winchester harrison harrison's upset with winchester um he is there um uh, at Frenchtown, and I, I got this cool little, uh, cool little picture here of his quarters, Winchester's headquarters on the River Raisin. Um, uh, okay, uh, that's a old picture I found somewhere. I haven't seen that. Actually, that's really neat. Yeah, um, and this, I mean, this is it's one of those that's definitely in the, like the public domain. Um, and then this was I showed this one earlier, but uh, kind of a little sketch of the the stockades 
um, on the River Raisin. Um, do you have, I mean, this is another random question. Do you know where they got the name of that River Raisin or? I don't, I think, I think the French named the river initially. Yeah. And uh, at least I've seen it appear in French several times. So I don't know. You were way too far north, I would think, for grapes, you know. So yeah. I, I don't know <laughs> why the name. Um, but it is interesting, you know. I, I, I don't know that. That's that's mm -hmm. a good question. Yeah. You know, something interesting about the the pictures you put up. That first one of General Hull's headquarters, uh, yeah, at the, at the River Raisin. You notice it's surrounded by nothing but trees, and that's because he didn't pick a house in town. The place uh -huh. where he's headquarters is about a mile from his troops. So, yeah. you know, that's another huge problem they have is he's delayed getting there. He's, he's saying, hey, guys, you all stay here. I'm going to go back in the back, relax a little. Yeah, hard <laughs> to blame him after everything. <laughs> Send me a runner if you need anything. Um, yeah, so so, so that's the, that's the thing. Uh, they, they take the town. If, um, right. Uh, they, they push the, push the um, uh, British back. Uh, they're nice and camped, um, sleep well. Uh, get it the next day ready for battle. Is that how it goes? Well, pretty close. There's a few days in between. This takes place on the 18th. Uh -huh. And so, you know, for a couple of days, you know, they're, they're having a good time. They're in camp. It's January 18th. Um, but people begin to get an uneasy feeling. And I, it's hard to tell how genuine that is because, you know, these folks are writing their journals or, or writing some of these accounts after the fact. Some journals were kept in real time, but other people yeah. are writing their experiences later. So it's hard to know if this is hindsight, but several people have said, you know, we begin to feel uneasy. Mm -hmm. uh, Harrison has realized what's happened. So he's on his way with reinforcements. But as day goes by, uh, people begin to feel like maybe that we haven't seen the last of the British. And January the 22nd is when the second battle takes place. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at about three days there. And reading <clears throat> the Kentucky, some of the journals and things from Kentucky troops, there was one man I know who mentioned he was sent out to find stragglers who had wandered outside camp. You know, you're supposed to be in camp at a certain time. And uh, he finds an inn or, a, you know, a, at a distance and he goes in and he sees two British officers and immediately leaves. And so, you know, that's a clue. Something yeah. might be wrong. Uh, you, the fact that still we're three days later, you know, the infantry who are camped outside the town still haven't dug in. I mean, there are so many issues going on that make people a little uncomfortable. And at dawn on January 22nd, um, the British fire on the camp and uh, American sentries spot them and they're able to shoot uh, the lead grenadier. But, uh, you know, as people are scrambling, uh, they've just woken up to get their guns. Another battle ensues. And this one's going to end very differently for the Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, the guys that had camped inside the town, those militiamen, are they're pretty good shots. And they've got uh, those wooden palisades to kind of hide behind and take aim. So they're not doing too terrible. Uh, but, of course, you know, the 17th U.S., which is camped outside, uh, they fight back as hard as they can. It's a very valiant effort. Uh, they're vulnerable. They're, vulnerable. Absolutely. I mean, they're out there in the open. And right. when, whenever you, you mentioned that as far as, I mean, are we talking about cavalry? Um or, That's a good question. You know. Mostly infantry. They've got mm -hmm. uh, a few um, cannon that they've drug through the woods. And uh, so you know, that, that's mainly what they're aiming at. And really, it's a very effective uh, tool against the wooden walls, you know, the Americans. So they know they haven't got uh, earth entrenchments, which, you know, to a lot of people sounds like it would be less effective. It's a big pile of dirt. But man, those things can absorb shock of cannonballs and that kind of thing. <laughs> um, so, but wooden walls, not so much. Yeah. So the British are firing into that. And there are accounts that the Americans singled them out. The Kentucky militia will single out gunners uh, because they're the most dangerous. So, you know, you're aiming at those crews who are, who are manning the few uh, guns the British have. So, yeah, it's mainly man to man. And it just is not going well for us. The yeah, British have about 600 Brits, about 800 uh, native allies with them. Okay, that's what that's what I was about to ask. Is how many are we talking about? So, six hundred British and then eight hundred native. Uh, is that was that what? So yes. that's almost two to one. That's pretty much about two to one. Yeah. Um, go ahead. You know, and the British are under command of uh, you know we uh, of General Proctor, who turns out to be uh, a pretty significant character in the battle that takes place afterwards. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. So th that's it's all pretty. Um, Wow, it's a pretty, 
I mean, it's a rough, it's a rough defeat, I guess, if you want to say for um, uh, Kentuckians, because there's a lot, um, a lot of people died. There's a lot of uh, people wounded. Um, we'll talk about this um, once we kind of get through the whole procedure. Um, I think it was Virgil McCracken, I think, that lost a leg. Uh, you know, we mm-hmm. got there. There's quite a few little stories here about uh, different Native Amer- or not Native Americans, different Kentuckians um, yeah. who um, will die and uh, pretty gruesomely. But um, how long? How long does this battle take? Um, I mean, looking at you know, not. Not that long. Uh, so. This this goes a few hours into the morning, and it, the guys out again outside the walls are pretty much done for shortly yeah. on. But the Americans uh, inside uh, again that picketed area hold out for a while, and uh, after several hours, they stop to eat. And uh, as they're trying to determine what to do at that point, yeah. um, they're low on ammunition, and uh, they decide it's best to parley with the British. Mm-hmm. Now, so, when you say when you say they stopped to eat, do they just hold up the lunch flag? Is that what it is? Uh, <laughs> yeah, the British have stopped for a second. You know, there, there's lulls and battles that happen, and of course, you're on your your stomach, or you're you're you know kind of crouched down behind something, and you're passing vittles down the line because you don't know how long this is going to last. So they're they're very watchful and they're still in battle position, but you know they, they've taken stock of their situation, and you need those carbs and that stamina to, to carry you on. <laughs> now, hold on, guys. I need me a quick. Uh, Quick uh, sip of milk and some cornbread. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Dunkin' Donuts uh, always makes me a little braver. I mean, I can see where they're coming from. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, uh, let's uh, mention a few of the um, uh, Kentucky, uh, some other, the, the, I guess if you want to say leadership. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so we have John Allen, correct? Yeah. Yep. And, and is he just a colonel? Yes. He, he, he lieutenant colonel. Yes. Okay. And then you also have um, George Madison. Right. Um, what was his rank? Was he a colonel as well? Uh, yes. I, I, had to, I had to stop and think for a second. And he's, of course, related to President Madison. That's right. Uh, so he, yep. He's his cousin. He's first in cousin. trouble. Because <laughs> Madison's <laughs> president at the time, you know, so he <laughs> remains a POW for the for the entirety of the war. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Captain, also, uh, well, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I was going to say, Madison's also a governor of Kentucky. Uh, yeah, he does. And he doesn't live long, unfortunately. He, he no, does in office. He's I, one I of think, the, uh, he, he only lived for like a month or so into his office. Yeah, I think his health was just broken. He was sent to Quebec as well, a prisoner. Yeah, this is a um, the side notes as well about him. Um, he, did, he, didn't, he really did not want to be the governor. Um, but he just was so kind of popular because of his, his, his captivity and all that kind of stuff. And he came back and like, you know, he was like, ah, he's like, guys, I'm not really that healthy. I don't really want to. And they're like, oh, you got to. And he actually yeah. ran unopposed and was elected. Um, yeah. And then, um, like, I mean, he was so sick. They, he didn't even get to Frankfurt. They had to swear him in at um, his home. And then he ended up dying. Like, yeah. I mean, he may be a month. Um, right. But anyway, go ahead. Next guy. You no, you're right. What are the shortest terms for a governor? Uh, yeah. you, you mentioned Virgil McCracken. Uh, Edmondson County. I know his name mm-hmm. for a river raisin casualty. John Edmondson. Sim- yep. Yes. Simpson County. John uh, Simpson. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Captain John Simpson. <laughs> um, Mead. Mead. Yep. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so there's several that are named. There's nine. Casualty. There's nine. Yeah. Nine. That's there's, right. Nine. Yep. And, um, um, uh, yeah. Uh, well, here's another one. Ballard. Uh, yeah, Blaine, Blaine really Ballard. Um, he's one of them. Um, and was he a captain? He was a he was up there in something, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah, he um, was captain. He's one of the unique ones, but no. Let's get... I'm sorry, Ballard, Ballard. We said yeah, major, major. Okay, which he's got a he's got a he's a bit more interesting, I guess, than some of the other ones. Uh, which we'll get to that. We we, we um. So anyway, the battle, the ones inside the fort or inside the I, I, it's not really a fort, I guess. Um. Yeah, you want to say like the well stockades or the the barrier, <laughs> right? Yeah, uh, just a wooden just a wooden wall basically. Um, they uh, kind of take their time and and uh, kind of figure out what to do. Yeah, they, they assess their situation. They're not in good shape, and the British offer them the chance to surrender and not be massacred. And they find out that uh, Winchester himself has been captured, mm-hmm. and so there's some decisions to be made. And uh, I don't want to belabor that the, the point with a lot of reading, but. One quote from that that I always thought was neat was uh, Madison, when he went out to negotiate with them, 
uh, he told them that the, the Kentucky militia would surrender, but they had to be promised, uh, you know, protection from the Indians. And Proctor, uh, the general, or he ends up being a general. He's not general yet either. But Colonel Proctor, um, you know, stomps his foot and says, "Do you mean to dictate to me, sir?" And Madison says, "Well, we, I intend to dictate for myself." He said, "You know, if we're going to be massacred. We would prefer to sell our lives as dearly as we can." Yeah. So the British agree that nothing will happen to the American troops if they surrender. Yeah. And uh, it turns out to be terribly, terribly wrong. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a, a bit of the battle, too. I mean, during the battle, um, you know, Madison played a pretty big role because so many people were kind of being captured or it was just going so wrong. Um, yeah. And then Winchester, of course, like you said, he rode in late. He was, you know, he, he was up in his, uh, you know, penthouse suite up there in the woods and uh, <laughs> it was a little late for the battle. That's and, right. Of course, got captured as well. Um, so yeah, as as you mentioned, um, it uh, that that was the deal that was uh, given, and the American troops and the the Kentuckians uh, surrendered. Um, they were given time to clean up the wounded and all that sort of stuff. But there was a problem, right? Again, you back to the parlay situation. Too many prisoners, uh, not enough guards. Right. And, you know, the British know that Harrison's coming. I mean, they, they realize the Americans have had three days to send word that they had taken French town. They realize reinforcements are on the way. So it is in Proctor's best interest, Colonel Proctor's best interest, to get as many prisoners as he can and get back into safe territory. So anyone who can walk uh, marches with the British. But a number of uh, prisoners are, are unable to, and they're left under the command of Native Americans. Some of them are left in French town with doctors, American doctors that had traveled with the troops uh, with the instructions that they would be you know, cared for. And the British would either come back and get them later or a worst case scenario, you know, they're recaptured um, by the Americans. So that's kind of the situation. And Proctor is uh, marching northward. And, and to be fair, uh, Harrison, when he hears about the loss doesn't know how many men Proctor has with him, doesn't have any native allies. So Harrison turns around and is marching back at this point. So no oh, help wow. is on the way. Oh man. Yeah, I didn't I didn't I didn't realize that. I mean, just because of uh the loss or just Yeah, he, he realized he doesn't want to put himself in the same position they're in. Uh, you know, yeah. the two forces combined would have been fairly formidable, mm -hmm. but now one is surrendered, so he would just be repeating the scenario again. He he doesn't know the enemy's strength. Or anything like that. So, yeah. I, and when he realizes it's lost, he he pauses. Mm -hmm. Well, well, probably probably a good idea at that point. But uh, um, so many, uh, like like you said, many had surrendered um, somewhere in the more uh, uh, left in French town. I think I think Virgil McCracken. I think he lost his uh, of, of, of half his leg, so he was one that was stuck in the um, uh, hospital. Or not the hospital, the house, or somebody's right. house there, just just to get doctored up. Um, right, how many hospital? Yeah, many, um, many more left as well. Um, um, do you uh, do you have a number off the top of your head of how many total was? Um, I forget. Died or just left. Um, yeah, I, I, I forget now what what the exact numbers are. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you know the the Kentuckians left who are wounded are, are heaving a sigh of relief. Uh, they hope help is on the way. The battle's the battle's over, and you've survived. And uh, you know your biggest concern in their mind right now is sepsis or something like that that can't be treated. You know, and uh, the British had promised, according to the Americans, to come back the next day with sleds and transport the wounded if they could. And uh, then they march out, and uh, there's very few British guards left through the night. There's mostly native warriors. And the next morning, very early on, according to eyewitnesses on the American side, uh, the British troops that were there left as well. And what takes place is what's known as the massacre. Uh, the yeah. warriors set the houses on fire. A lot of the wounded were too ill and injured to get out. Those that did make it to the door were either shoved back in or tomahawked in some instances. So, uh, you know, hundreds of Kentuckians uh, are killed in the battle and, and in the subsequent massacre. And hundreds are made prisoners and marched uh, northeast, not sure if they'll ever see their families again. And in that yeah. journal we talked about, you know, they sleep in barns. It's January in Canada, you know, oh, so that they're yeah. seeking shelter wherever they can. And it's just yeah. a rough time. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's why, that's the, I mean, that's where it comes from, the river massacre. Now, some people, I've, I've heard some people say, you know, the natives were drinking, um, those sorts of things. Um, you know, I don't, I don't really know. What all did... Um, 
what all any, any other journal evidence of like kind of what led into it or just I mean it was a complete surprise or the, the the Kentuckians if I remember correctly there were accounts that the night before you know there, there was a lot of shouting and, and, and things about native wars around the fire the, the sorts of things you would do and the rituals you would do if you were preparing to take action of some sort uh, and I would have to go back and find that exact source but uh, yeah there, there was just you know, a sense of foreboding that hadn't been there immediately after the battle. Like I say, they, they feel like they're going to be either transported by sled or maybe recaptured by the Americans. And as the night progressed, you know, things begin to, to change for them. Mm-hmm. And the word that made it back to Frankfurt was no less dramatic. Um, if you've ever seen a painting of Isaac Shelby, I would love to know what Isaac Shelby looks like smiling. Uh, that, that might be <laughs> a, a thesis for an undergraduate history student somewhere yeah. with, with a filter on their phone or something. Because every yeah. picture you see of Shelby, he's always so grim, you know. But mm-hmm. apparently he can have fun and, and let loose also because he and Mrs. Shelby had been, uh, he and Susanna Shelby had been at the theater in Frankfurt. Mm. And uh, they were seeing a play. And uh, the, the accounts say that, you know, the doors opened and a militiaman rushes in and he's covered in blood, or covered in mud from riding hard and uh, whispers something to Shelby and Shelby immediately rises and leaves. And they said mm-hmm. the play just kind of ends at that point because people realize something really bad has happened. And it's probably the worst defeat. I mean, I'm almost certainly it's the worst defeat for Kentucky troops ever, uh, as far as percentages and that sort of thing, um, yeah. because that entire wing of the army is wiped out and it leaves Harrison in a huge predicament too, because now one whole side of his force is left wide open. Yeah. And he knows the British are coming, and they certainly are, and they have their eyes set on other targets, including Fort Meigs. Yeah, yeah, and that 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 will be the you know I guess that's that's the next kind of battle uh, we'll, we'll talk about. I, I did want to you know uh, that's one of the kind of the big pictures that whenever you Google remember the raisin, but uh, you know I don't really know <laughs> uh, that that picture doesn't always I guess make the most sense. I, the the People on the horses always they kind of look a little odd to me, but yeah, and that's actually the the battle uh, of the at the River Thames. That's, oh, maybe that's what it is. <laughs> but their their rallying cry is "Remember the race." And yeah, yeah, was, yeah. They're out. They're out for vengeance. So yeah, yeah. and that's kind of the thing. You know, Kentuckians for throughout the rest of the war, um, you know, use that as their their battle cry. Uh, Remember the race, and um, uh, and to kind of go over, you know, we talked about. Um, uh, George Madison and um, uh, kind of ha- yeah, he was kind of left in command for a good part of the battle. Um, yeah. I, I did want to um, uh, mention um, some of these people that uh, were got counties named after them. So you got Benjamin Graves, right? Uh, who he was left to recover from his injuries. Uh, Pascal Hickman, he was the one who had his leg amputated um, okay. Okay. because of you know a, a battle, but he was left as well. <clears throat> now Nathaniel Hart. He was told um, by a British officer that he would, that they would have safe travel as prisoners, mm-hmm. uh, but he ended up um, uh, dying as well. Um, now, Bland Ballard, uh, he was one of the ones that was able to escape, um, and uh, he was not killed. Um, he, uh, 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 let me see, did we say he was a major, um, or whatever yeah. his title may be? Yes, he was. He was major. Yeah. Um, now, now, um, and I'll show old Bland back again there. Um, now the other guy, uh, John Allen, he went, he died, he uh, rode into the forest, I believe, and he was eventually, um, or he was killed as well. Now, I don't know if he was, ki- which, if he was killed in the initial battle or if it was, um, when I say the initial battle, I, I guess I should say the second battle, mm-hmm. um, or if he was killed. Uh, afterwards but i don't think he was wounded or anything so he probably was killed during the second battle when the british attacked back i would assume yes. mm-hmm. so um and then let's see some of the ones some of the people I, I i did as much research as i could but you really i mean did not get a lot of information on how they died or what may have happened um but a quick just list of who um all those county names. So you got Allen after John right. Allen, uh, Ballard is Bland Ballard, John Edmondson, um, Benjamin Graves, uh, Nathaniel Hart, um, Pascal Hickman, mm-hmm. Virgil McCracken, James Mead, and John Simpson. There you go. Those are the ones. Those are the ones. That's and right. I think it, 
when you think about it, there's probably I, I wonder just how why they picked those nine. Um, probably ranking, I assume. Maybe they were officers. Yeah, I would assume so. Some of them too were, were fairly prominent initially. Like you know, the, the Hearts were well known in Kentucky. Uh, well, I mean, um, Susanna Shelby, the, the governor's wife, was a Hart. That was her maiden name. So they're a fairly established family. Uh, John Allen's well respected. You know, some of these guys are lawyers, and they, they played a significant role in Kentucky's uh, social but, scene. Well, they were politicians that said, "Hey, let's go join up." <laughs> yeah, some of them, yeah, some of them, some of them were just attorneys, and then yeah, but you know, you were going to make that was a good way to make your name, you know, in yeah. that time. And, and, that, and it worked out for, I mean, for these. That's I mean, right. of, <laughs> Not the way they planned. But but, it's, yeah. <laughs> Not the way they hoped for, but, you know, they, they got a name. They got a county that's named after them. Right. You know, sadly, most likely, you know, some of these people don't even, uh, some of those people in the counties may not even remember or know why they were named after, uh, why their county's named after that. Um, hopefully this will you know, help bring some light to it. Um, right. Uh, yeah. Um, I, you know, it, it's so Italian. Yeah. Um, some of the some of the things the old Bland Ballard got out of there. He he was he was one of the few, um, but the other the other eight man they all died. Um, and uh, you can there's a the monument in Frankfurt at um, the State Mount in the middle of the Frankfurt Cemetery. You know, it has that big tower. I don't know if you've seen it. Have you? Seen, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know it has all their names on there, and uh, that's one of the sections. And it, it goes to tell a lot too that this was the biggest battle loss of right. uh, Kentuckians ever. Um, mm. And, you know, and, and I guess, of course, you know, it's kind of harder to say that and determine that now, you know, with the bigger scale of a military. Um, right. But, you know, back then, I mean, that's how it worked. You had state state militias. And, um, uh, you know, I guess, you know, we got to remember the raising. That's right. And see, you know, it's really <laughs> counting by percentages. You know, it was a huge loss, you know, even during the Civil War when they would have battles. If you look at the casualties their regiment took. Versus mm -hmm. some of these, the numbers are less, but yeah, you're right. It was a huge loss. So. Huge loss. Like we said, you know, um, one thing you always got to do, especially as a Kentuckian, is remember the raisin. Absolutely. Um, anything else uh, that you want to throw in before we uh, wrap this one up about the, uh, the Battle of Frenchtown uh, or the River Raisin Massacre? I think that covers it. You know, the only thing being that it, it, this was an affront, not just the losses in the battles, but the way the troops were treated afterwards. And, uh, you know, that sort of thing. It was very much an affront to Kentucky's honor. And so, yeah, they were, uh, they were, they were hurt by it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I think about this too, and I, I know this is not, you know, uh, uh, maybe, maybe that might not be a good comparison, but I think of something like a, a national thing, you know, you have like Pearl Harbor, um, right. you have the old 9-11, you have those in incidents that was really a rallying call for people uh, nationally. And, and this was a rallying call nationally as, as well, I'm sure, uh, but especially specifically for Kentucky. I mean, it, it was a direct hit to Kentucky, not the land, but definitely the people, because that's a lot of uh, a lot of people that you know, died in this battle. You know, to say you know, massacred as well, um, that 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 doesn't help any. <laughs> uh, really? No, but um, I guess if that, if nothing else. Um, Thanks again for coming on. Uh, again, you can get the the, the War of 1812 in the West um, in any kind of bookstores. Google search it, and it comes up. Uh, so if you want to learn more, uh, more of those good details, more of their journals. you got a lot of the journals in there, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and and so forth. Um, again, uh, subscribe to the channel. All that gets uh, David, uh, <laughs> thanks for coming on again. Um, anything else? And the only thing is, you know, if you're ever in Monroe, Michigan, uh, there is a national battlefield there now. Oh, cool. You can tour it. You can see what it was like. You can walk the field where these Kentuckians walk. Damn. And there are actually monuments in the town thanking Kentuckians for their service. So definitely Damn. worth a shot if that, you're in there. That sounds like a, a road trip. <laughs> it was for us. It was a good one. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that sounds like a real good one. huh? I didn't, I didn't, I, I mean, I guess I just hadn't thought, is there a battlefield there or is it a monument? But, uh, that's really cool. Yeah. Well, you know, it didn't become a national battlefield until 2008. President Obama did that. So before that, they kind of maintained it on their own. But, yeah, it, it's definitely worth seeing. They've got some federal money in there, and it, it's a, it really tells the story brilliantly. All right. Well, that sounds good. That's a good note to end on. Go visit the monument or the, the battlefield. In. That's right. <laughs> Next time you're in Michigan. <laughs> um, well, uh, that sounds good. Thanks again, uh, David, for coming on. And uh, thanks for listening, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Welcome to the Kentucky History Channel, where we strive to bring you all the Kentucky history content 
you want and you deserve. Kentucky is a part of all of us, and we plan on covering all the history we can, from Pike County to Fulton County, from Louisville to Harlan. Here on our YouTube channel, you can find many videos dedicated to different events, people, governors, and places in Kentucky. There's something for everybody. While you're here, if you like the channel, hit the subscribe button and the notification button so you get notified anytime new Kentucky history is available. And if you want to support the channel, we have a Patreon page as well, or patreon.com slash kyhistorypod. You've probably heard about Daniel Boone, but what about the rest of the frontiersmen who came to Kentucky and settled? That's what we want to bring to the Kentucky History Channel, the stories of the untold, the stories of those forgotten, one thing to expect on our channel is great Kentucky content. Some stories that you've never heard of. The Night Riders, who began in Western Kentucky. Bloody Monday, the riots in Louisville. The assassination of Governor Goebel, the only governor ever assassinated in the United States. Stories from all over Kentucky, stories that are unforgettable once you've heard them. You can find out who counties in Kentucky are named after and how your county got started. From beginning to end, we plan to document every county in Kentucky, all 120. Reach out to us on all of our social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And also leave a comment on one of our YouTube videos. You can also check out our podcast episodes. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and many more. We're always seeking to find more Kentucky history so we can bring it to you. The viewers, the listeners, we want all the stories and all the events from Kentucky's great history to be told and shared everywhere.